character from Old Testament scripture who struggled with her desire so deep to have a child, when she finally did give birth to a son, she brought that son Samuel to the priest, and she had him dedicated to the Lord. And in a similar fashion, Mary and Joseph, grateful for the gift of their child Jesus, brought him to the temple at the appropriate time that he might be blessed and dedicated to God, even as they as parents gave thanks for the gift of this child. And so in good company, you have come to the sanctuary where you worship God, and you have brought Mateo in order that he might not only be cherished and seen by his church family, but that he might be dedicated to God. And so I ask you simply some questions as parents, as you think to the future that Matteo has with us and with Jesus your Christ and with you as a family. Do you promise as parents, by personal example, family practice, and the things that you say to Matteo, to show him the joy of a life in Christ? If so, will you say, we will? We will. And will you, by family practice at home, continually uplift the presence of God in your family life, showing Matteo that God is with him always and will never forsake him? We will. We will. And will you continue to give thanks for God as you are on this day, as he grows and matures and becomes his own person with his own ideas, even differences with yours. Continue to give thanks for the blessing that he is. We will. Mm -hmm. And the full name of this child? Mateo Rafael Jimenez. Mateo Rafael Jimenez. A new member of the choir, from what I can hear. <laughs> <laughs> is it all right now? Yeah. What is it? Oh, I think he went out. Oh, it weighs more than my kid Laura did it. Uh, 18 months. So. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing great. He's doing great. Mateo Rafael Jimenez. With great joy, your church family blesses you. And we know that God blesses you. May you grow in wisdom and stature in the light and love of God. Amen. Amen. Good boy. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Gracious God, it is always a gift to receive a child in our midst. For all that Matteo and Jennifer and AJ have been through, having a pregnancy through a pandemic, a birth, a delivery, and going through all these first things in this unusual time. We know you have always been with them and always will be. May we as church family rejoice and give thanks that you give us community, you give us strength, and you give us your love. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>
and it is our practice to recall the names of those from our own company who have passed away since the last All Saints Day. And so we remember today Bill and Carol Decker, Donna Applegate, Melanie Barrett, and Joanne Oliver. Will you join me in prayer as we give thanks for their lives of faithful O oh God, our Creator, Sustainer, and Renewer, we come before you with humble appreciation that your power is expressed toward us in a mighty love. We are grateful for this opportunity to worship in person, to worship virtually, to worship in freedom. We give you thanks for the courage and insights of our forebears who cared enough to speak up and speak out for what they believed to be the best ways to return your love and to act upon it. We pray for the strength in ourselves to protest when that is called for, to keep silence when that truth serves your will, and whether we are silent or whether we are speaking, to seek reconciliation as we promote your strong love. We cherish the rich heritage of our church and each great saint who has made it what it is today. We ask you to alert to us the contemporary meanings of our history and our traditions, that we might seek not to live in the past, but by your grace to let the best of the past live on through us to meet current needs. Finally, God, as we enter this time, we open ourselves to your discipline and guidance. We who tend to get out of shape spiritually, Call upon you, reform us into your image, into sturdy and energetic children who are decisively your own. In spirit and in truth, be present among us as we pray. In Christ's name. Amen. Those who showed endurance. 
You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. And I need it right now. Most of us, I suspect, have at some point in our lives prayed this common prayer. How about you? This week, both at our Zoom Bible study and our weekly gathering in the parlor to listen reflectively to the scripture of the day for Sunday, we heard these words and we found ourselves in deep conversation about this particular verse. Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. You also must be patient. I know that I have preached to you before on the virtue of patience, but 2020 has cast a different light on this verse from James for me. The patience which James describes, the patience which he prescribes, is not the patience of a child waiting to go off trick-or-treating or the patience of a family in a long line at Disney World. This is the patience of a farmer who does not know if those needed rains will come. 
This is the patience of prophets who were humiliated, ignored, persecuted, and defamed. This is the patience of Job, who lost everything, health, wealth, family, and even the support of his trusted friends. This is patience through suffering. James reminds us of stories we already know about others who have done this hard thing, others who have needed to be patient through a season of suffering. His first example is that farmer longing for precious fruit. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. The farmer gives everything to those plants, uses skill, hard work, and determination to care for the grain and the grapes, the dates and the olives. But the farmer knows at the end of the day, the most important thing, the sun and the rain, the farmer has no control over. This is hard won waiting. Because the precious thing you do not have, the precious fruit you can almost taste already, may not come. A few verses later, James points us to the prophets, saying, As an example of suffering and patience, my brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Now, some of you may remember a long sermon series from last fall on the prophet Jeremiah. I pointed out how Jeremiah wails and complains and carries on like no other. He does that because speaking for God in a world that has strayed far from the will of God is hard and unpleasant. Jeremiah is not stoic about it. He is not a stiff upper lip, strut around like everything is going to be okay kind of guy. He's passionate. Jeremiah is reactive and so, so frustrated with the people around him. When is it all going to end? How long do we have to keep on doing this? Lord, give me patience. And I need it right now. This is the prayer of prophets. Because patience through suffering is emotional, difficult, and messy. And then in verse 11, James takes us to the story of Job. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. The book of Job is a bit of his Hebrew wisdom literature, a courtroom drama featuring a protagonist, Job, put on trial by the prosecutor, Satan, and retaining the defense of Almighty God. Each act of the play takes us from loss to loss as theological arguments about the purpose of God are each trotted out and put on display through the characters of Job's so-called friends. Job loses ten children and his wife, all his livestock, the produce of his land. He loses his looks. His skin is covered in boils. He loses his reputation and his place in the community. Wealth and influence evaporate, and his friends become harping judges, spouting their half-baked ideas about why God allows us to suffer in this world. And yes, Job is steadfast, choosing not to curse God and die. But go back and read Job. Job struggles. He brings every part of himself to the battle for his life and his life's meaning. In this epic struggle through loss, even in the midst of confusion over where God is in the midst of it all, Job does not give up, but instead directly confronts the Almighty with all of his questions and all of his pain. And that is what is remembered as the steadfastness of Job. Not a stiff upper lip, not a Pollyanna view. Patience through suffering 
is endurance and steadfastness. So how do we find our own patience and steadfastness to endure our trying times? Where do we even begin? This week, several in our Zoom Bible study zeroed in on a particular command from today's reading, which in our cute little picture journals is translated, establish your hearts. That instruction sent me searching through scripture, looking at the many passages which speak about the human heart, a favorite image of the prophet Jeremiah and a word which also makes frequent appearances in the teachings of Jesus. The heart is the great foundation of our faith. Jesus says that our gracious or unkind words proceed from the heart. Jesus says where our treasure is, our hearts will follow. And the pure of heart see God. And out of the good treasure of a pure heart, good is produced. Establish your heart, James pleads with us. So I also went scrambling to look at that word, establish, translated differently in different versions, but I liked it from the English Standard Version. To establish is to set up on a firm and permanent basis. And the related word, foundation, is defined as an occasion when something is established. So while reflecting on this phrase, establish your heart, the picture which would not leave my mind was the foundation, which Ed has been building on our farm for a new greenhouse. With painstaking attention to detail, he has been measuring and squaring measuring and leveling, digging deep into the dirt and sinking posts, settling the posts with gravel, and then measuring and squaring and leveling all over again. All to be sure that when the joyful time comes to erect the greenhouse walls, walls and windows whose shipping I am impatiently awaiting, there will be a proper foundation to build upon, firmly established. But let's face it, winter's coming. The late rains have interfered. The ground has been hard, then wet, now cold. The decking requires careful measuring and cutting. The wood must be stained and sealed so the decking can be completed. And the greenhouse company doesn't guarantee that the structural parts will even get to us before April. Everybody in the U.S. and Canada, it seems, got excited about gardening this year. And that small family greenhouse business has seen their orders more than triple. Supply chains have been interrupted. You know the story. So we must be patient. One thing's very clear. This is not the fun part of building a greenhouse. More than once, I've come home from work, looked at the evolving foundation, and asked, aren't you done with that yet? Where's my greenhouse? James says the implanted word has the power to save your souls. And that caught my eye. As a gardener, I am always, always thinking about what I might get out there and plant. The point of getting a greenhouse for me is to hurry up the process of me planting to get a jump start on an eventual harvest. I want my garden and I want it now. But this is not that season. This is the season of delays and disappointments, a time for slogging through the difficult and essential work of establishing a firm foundation for the vision of what will follow. Spiritually, 2020 has been a season for establishing our hearts, a season for difficult foundation work, a season for tending to and for nurturing the already implanted word which we have within us. As the pandemic surges, 
Important elections loom, travel plans are canceled, and family gatherings postponed. We cry out together with Jeremiah and Job, how long, O oh Lord? Do we have to do this forever? And the wisdom of James echoes back. You also must be patient, so establish your hearts. Amen. join us in saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you will pull out your communion kits, this is the time in the service when we are reminded that what is horrible trouble can be transformed by the grace of God into life and love and a new way of being with one another. Because it is here that we tell the story. 
It is here where we remember that on the very night he was to be betrayed by a friend, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, and broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this cup is a new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you eat and drink, remember me.